All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce Sohail Sheikh. Um, he's a senior solutions architect with MongoDB. He's been here. He joined us back during uh, COVID, kind of at the peak of COVID, like in 2020. Uh, but he's got over 10 years of software development experience, uh, mostly in the startup world. Uh, he's well versed in application performance management, and he's helped a lot of our enterprise customers monitoring the health of their ecosystems. Um, so today he works with our Fortune 100 customer, customers to help them uh, integrate and innovate a little bit faster. So with that, I will hand it off to Sohail. Thank you. Imagine for a moment that you're trying to create a report that you need to present to your executive team that summarizes the health of your business and the different components of your ecosystem. Or imagine that you've been tasked to figure out if two applications that you own should be merged together into a single product. If you've been in these shoes before, if you could please raise your hand and I could see. Yep, many of us have been there. And as you can see, we're not alone. The amount of effort that it takes to be able to take the type of data that we need, to analyze it, to be able to make sense of it, is a lot of work. It almost seems like a never-ending task. And because of this, we know that we have many tools in the industry that are basically BI tools that allow us to put the data together. But getting the data there is an extremely tedious task. So hello, everyone. My name is Sohail Sheikh, and I'm a senior solutions architect here based locally out of Dallas. And today, we're going to be talking a lot about what Atlas SQL is. Our SQL engines team is the one that builds this entire product that allows the MongoDB data to be accessed via a SQL query and SQL-based BI tools. I'm guessing you all are here because you've pretty much been using MongoDB or you just wanted to have a lot of fun day off of work to join our conference today. But regardless of what it is, I'm glad you're here and let's get started. So today we're gonna to take a look at what the future needs to look like. Right, and the future has a few different components. The first is that wouldn't it be really, really nice if our future had a BI tool experience that we didn't need to constantly sync, that wouldn't constantly break, where the drivers and the connectors, they were actually managed by MongoDB and not some third party, and the fact that we wouldn't have to use a third party driver like Simba or CData, and it would be really nice if this connector just worked. Wouldn't it also be really, really nice if this entire connector, so to speak, would actually just natively integrate with the document model? Because what we find today is that the original structure of the data is stripped, and then there is a lot of polymorphism that's happening from the traditional relational database. And all of this converting back and forth just seems really painful. Or wouldn't it be just great if we could write in the dialect that we're already used to from the SQL 92 that a lot of the standardization has happened across the industry? And then you ask yourself, wait, like I've heard of this thing called the BI connector and wasn't it using that? Yes, we'll definitely talk about that. But it'd be much better if we could ergonomically extend that to the point where we could query the data in MongoDB natively. So the future sounds really, really good, and I'm really happy to tell you that the future is here. Welcome to Atlas SQL, where we have created a brand new MongoDB native SQL experience that is now available in preview mode in Atlas today. Now, what we're going to be talking about today is going to be exactly what Atlas SQL is. We'll compare it to MongoDB's existing SQL offerings. We will also go look at it uh, against the BI connector. We'll also go take a look at a little bit more technically how type systems work, which is my favorite part of this talk. And then finally, I'll give you a sneak peek into what the future of this looks like over the course of the next six to 12 months. So Atlas SQL is not like a single application, or it's not like a single component that's actually running. It's four different pieces of the software that are coming together to make this amazing thing happen. And the first component is a SQL interface. So MongoDB has built a native SQL interface called the $SQL 
that you can now use in your aggregation pipelines. So what we're saying here is that you can pull up an aggregation pipeline, which is JSON formatted, and inside of one of those JSON blocks, you can write a dollar SQL operator and inside of that fill in SQL code, select, insert, whatever it may be. The next component is the fact that the SQL dialect is actually a custom 92 compatible dialect, which has now become a first class citizen of our product suite. What this means is that there is no more of having to convert things between the relational data formats and Mongo's document format and having to unwind and remove the complexities of the data that exist in document model, which is really, really nice to use, for example, arrays, and then not have those advantages in the relational model. The third is native SQL drivers. For years, and I'm, I say years, but I've been here a couple of years, as we know, and in these couple of years, I cannot tell you the number of customers who have told me that they would love JDBC and ODBC drivers that would allow them to communicate over the database platforms to be able to get data from one place to another. So MongoDB has created a native JDBC driver that wraps the Mongo Java driver with the ODBC driver coming out real soon. And the last component is going to be the BI tool connectors. So of course, we want to be able to look at all of this data and analyze it, but let's be honest, you need to be able to look at it in your SQL tools that you're already using, or tools that use SQL. So for example, Tableau, right, which is an integration that already exists today, and Looker and Power BI are in the near future horizon. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna take a look at how does data actually move and how do these pieces all come together and interact when we're going from Tableau on the right side to a MongoDB Atlas cluster on the left. So the BI tool begins by executing a query that's an execute query, which is a JDBC method it gets an immediate result back and result set, which is the JDBC equivalent of a cursor. The BI tool then calls the get metadata method on the result set because it needs to know exactly what the schema of the result set will be. To get the result schema set, the JDBC driver has to issue a SQL get result schema, which will then go to the Atlas SQL interface. The SQL query is compiled, and then the type interface is used to deduce the shape and the result set that the query needs to generate. The result set is then returned to the JDBC driver as a JSON schema, which is then passed back to Tableau as a result set metadata, which is essentially giving it an exact schema that it needs to be able to call the data. So now what the BI tool will do is it'll iterate on the result set cursor. And it's gonna go back to the JDBC driver knowing what the schema looks like, and it's going to basically ask for some data using the dollar SQL aggregation that we just talked about. That is going to go into the aggregation pipeline, and then it's gonna go into that larger scheme of just running the query and getting the data, which it has to pull out of the Atlas cluster. Once the data comes back, the result is passed back through the Atlas Data Federation back to the driver, which exposes it directly back to Tableau. So what we've seen here is an end-to-end -end process of how each time we need data inside of Tableau, we can now natively call it out of an Atlas SQL database. So the question may be like, well, isn't it always been this way? And unfortunately, it hasn't been. See, before, and a lot of us may be used to this, we were using the BI connector. And the BI connector was basically a MySQL wrapper in order to allow us to communicate with these databases. The problem with that wrapper is that we did not have the two components in the middle. We had to do a lot of conversion through that wrapper, through that BI connector. We had to install it separately, maintain it separately, and oh gosh, if it was buggy, I mean, we're talking about no ability to fix it. That's what we have truly revolutionized and fixed as part of this data journey. So next what we're going to take a look at is how do we compare Atlas SQL with the BI connector? At the very basic level, 
BI Connector and Atlas SQL both solve the same problem. They're basically providing BI tools and other SQL users a way to connect to the query uh, that they want to run inside of MongoDB. However, the details of how they accomplish this are very different. In the following slides, we're going to highlight some of the key differences that are between the BI Connector and Atlas SQL. These differences explain why MongoDB decided to build out Atlas SQL from scratch rather than continuing to invest in the iterations of BI Connector. The first major difference is an architectural one. The BI Connector is a proxy server that implements the MySQL wire protocol on the front end and talks to MongoDB on the back end. The Atlas SQL interface, on the other hand, is an embedded library that is of the Atlas Data Federation. Compared to the BI connector, Atlas SQL's embedded deployment model significantly reduces the overhead maintaining the product since we don't have to maintain the MySQL wire protocol anywhere anymore, as well as all of the plumbing and the networking that actually goes into the long running server processes. The next difference between the BI connector and the Atlas SQL is how structured and polymorphic data are presented to SQL users. Because the BI connector is an implementation of MySQL wire protocol, it is constrained by a set of features and concepts that exist in MySQL. MySQL has no concept of polymorphic data, nor does it have documents and array types. It doesn't have sub-documents. As a result, the BI connector gets rid of these non-relational concepts. It does so by flattening out the documents and the polymorphic fields into separate columns and unwinding the arrays into separate rows. The data transformation losses, the data transformation loses the richness and it essentially costs us in terms of performance since queries that are running on the table that contain the polymorphic data are basically conditional projections of unwinds that are extremely costly to run through. Atlas SQL, on the other hand, supports querying your structured and polymorphic data in the original form. Users who still wish to see the data flattened can do so by running a flatten or an unwind table function that we have added to this dialect. The next major difference that we're going to talk about today is the way that the SQL dialect is used by each one of the products. Since the BI connector implements MySQL, the dialect of MySQL, which the Atlas SQL is using, the custom dialect, these two are very, very different. Both dialects share a common base of features and behaviors, but the way in which they are implemented diverge drastically. And that's where we see the biggest performance impacts as well. So where Atlas SQL adds features outside of the SQL 92 spec, it does so in a way that is underlyingly compatible with the MongoDB aggregation pipeline and the primitives that MongoDB uses at the core. So we're talking about the document model and the way that Mongo functions it at its base. The BI connector, on the other hand, is, led, is tied to the semantics that MySQL has already implemented in order to really impersonate MySQL, it has to behave the same way for every single query. Unfortunately, in many cases, these semantics don't work out well for us. They're not efficient at all. And it means that if we have any problems with it, guess what? We can't fix it because we don't own it. Of course, performance doesn't ever come for free. And MongoDB has invested a lot of time and money and effort to make the BI connector very performant and efficient over the years. Many of those efficiencies are being ported over as we speak today into the Atlas SQL connector. The difference here is that in order to build on top of the Atlas SQL connector, Mongo's life is significantly easier. This is really as simple as you guys saying that, hey, I ran into a bug, and us saying we can put that on our product roadmap, rather than coming back to you and telling you, sorry, hands up, it's a MySQL problem and we can't do anything about it. This ultimately allows us to innovate a lot faster too, because it allows us to build in new features that you all are requesting today. And that is how we innovate together. The final key difference 
between the BI connector and Atlas SQL that we're gonna highlight today is the fact that the BI connector was a third-party client, whereas Atlas SQL is a first-class citizen of MongoDB. It's a product that Mongo maintains and manages. So when we talk about client software that's written by someone else, like the MySQL team in this case, there's very limited things that we can do. But when we talk about products that are maintained by Mongo, there's obviously a lot more that we can do. Back when the BI connector was just coming out, it made a lot of sense for Mongo to actually take that approach rather than creating Atlas SQL from the get-go. And the reason was, and the main advantage was, the fact that we had a SQL dialect, a third-party client that was willing to do all of that communication for us. The only thing that we really had to do at Mongo was to build out the SQL to aggregation translations that the BI connector would be able to understand. And this ultimately was extremely effective and a really good decision by Mongo as a company because it allowed us to go to market faster with a tool that ultimately did work. Yes, there were some pains, but it did allow us to be able to analyze data that was inside of Mongo in a relatively short amount of time. We're very comfortable today as Mongo to say that majority of the SQL to aggregation translations are pretty much complete. We have a pretty good understanding of the data and the way that document model can handle all of the different data types. So it's time for us to further invest into how we can make the lives of all of our customers, all of you, easier when you are interacting with SQL-like tools. And because of this, we've created a better client-side story that allows us to bring the Atlas SQL experience to you as a first-class citizen. So now the next thing that we are really going to discuss is how does all of this kind of take place in the back end and really what are some of the key components that drive Atlas SQL to its success and differentiate us in the market. And that is called Atlas SQL type system. The way we model data in the compiler for Atlas SQL is unique in the industry and is one of the key factors that allows us to combine the rich document model along with the way that we have powerful expressive queries in the relational world without losing the expressiveness of either. We're gonna highlight two main aspects of type systems. The first is static typing and the second is structural typing. Static typing is when you use type information at compile time. The opposite of static typing is dynamic typing, where you type information instead at runtime. Common examples of static typing are languages like C and Java, whereas languages like Python and JavaScript are dynamically typed. Most relational databases have static type systems while MongoDB aggregation pipeline is a dynamically typed system. A structural system is a static type system that distinguishes data by the structure. For example, the fields that it may contain, as opposed to the name that it's given when declared. Most prevalent example of structural type system in today's world is uh, TypeScript. Most relational databases despite being statically typed, don't have structural type systems because they only support scalars, not structured data types like documents and arrays. That's the reason why we ultimately lose the expressiveness when we have to do the conversion in the BI connectors today. Atlas SQL has a static structural type system. And in the next few slides, we'll understand a bit more of exactly what this looks like in practice and why this is such a powerful combination. So let's start with static typing. Static typing has a few different benefits. The first being the fact that it has a type interface at compile time. What this means is that the Atlas SQL type interface is used to compute the schema for the query's result set without actually executing the query. This is exactly how SQL get result schema command we discussed earlier works. 
And without static typing, it would be effectively impossible for us to correctly implement the JDBC get metadata method, since we'd have no way of actually finding the result schema without first executing the query and iterating through all of the return documents. Statically compute, uh, and this essentially allows us to statically compute and figure out the schema that we want to be able to use ahead of time. The second benefit that really comes out of this is that there will be no runtime errors. So really the example that we need to think about here is you start a query that's gonna take a very, very long time to run because it's for an analytical use case, so that's totally acceptable. So let's say the query takes seven hours to run. So right before you're leaving work, five, six p.m., you're like, I'm gonna kick off this query. Everything's gonna be great when I come back in the morning. It's gonna be completely finished. All my data is gonna be in Tableau. Life is great. You start the query, you shut down your laptop, you go home, you have a great dinner. Two hours in though, the system in the background fails. Your query has failed. So you come back the next day and you look at the query results and you go, well, why did that happen? Well, it may have happened for multiple reasons, but what would have been really nice is static typing because we would have known the schema that was available to the system ahead of time and we would have been able to catch whatever error there may have been, and we're gonna take a look at an example specifically of what that error could look like. The third benefit that we get out of static typing is the ability to have a configurable strictness. And what this means is that static typing itself can sometimes become a hindrance. So if we wanted to filter predicate guarantees that type constraints will never be violated, and the compiler isn't clever enough to figure it out, we'd have big problems. So let's say, for example, you have a select where A plus B needs to be done. A is an integer, B is an integer. In cases like these, it would be really good to just override the static typing for the checks and just fall back to the dynamic checking. The Atlas SQL compiler has the ability to do this internally today, and we're working on a project which will expose this to all of you all very soon as well. So let's go take a look at that example that we were referring to. Consider the collection that we see here on the right where we have the documents where there's a field A and a field B. You see integers in the first couple of them. And then let's say in the millionth document, you have A, which is a string, and B, which is an integer. So Obviously, if we were to run this in the MongoDB aggregation pipeline today, what would happen by the nature of how we're structured is that we would try to add fields A and B, and we would do them for the first 999,999 documents, and even, res even return those result sets. When we get to the millionth document to give this a shot, we would fail, and that's when we would error out. However, if we were using the equivalent Atlas SQL query that we have now created and made available, and we would have been able to get the schema information on the method foo before, ahead of time, we would have errored out immediately. So in that example, where we started a query and it failed out two hours later because it got to the millionth document, we wouldn't have had to wait that long. And that would have been amazing because it would have saved us so much time, so much headache, that we could have eliminated simply by just having a check to know that at some point, the field A has a string in it and not an integer, and clearly I cannot add a string and an integer. Working in the combination of static typing is structural typing. One of the key benefits of structural typing is that it enables us to allow compile time guarantees like the ones that we just demonstrated if we have incomplete schema information. This is crucial for making Atlas SQL useful for all kinds of data models because there are some MongoDB data modeling techniques that will result from the schemas that constantly change over time. For most relational databases, complete schema information is a hard requirement and it is painful to model data with a dynamic number of fields. That's what we used to do in the relational world. We don't do that in Mongo anymore. 
And that's extremely important when we're trying to build Atlas SQL queries and trying to use BI connector that we shouldn't be forced to build schemas ahead of time because it's gonna hinder with our ability and our velocity to build out the applications. Structural typing is far more effective than rigid schemas and it allows the synergy between the document model and the schema tooling to happen very easily. So let's consider another example. In this case, we have a JSON schema that describes a collection and the Atlas SQL query that's gonna run against that collection. Despite the fact that we don't even know whether fields A and B exist, we can still compile and query, uh, and, query and guarantee that this will not error out at runtime. This is a simple but very neat example because it allows us to see the flexibility that we have that's needed to work with the document model without actually sacrificing the compile time safely. So as we bring things to a wrap, let's take a look at what the future holds for Atlas SQL. The first thing that we've already done is kind of release the JDBC driver, and the immediate thing that we're working on right now is the ODBC driver as we speak of it today. Once we're done with the ODBC driver, we're going to start working on adding more support for other BI tools. Power BI and Looker are some of our first priorities just based off of what customers' inputs have been. But we're also going to be looking into building a workbench style tool like dBeaver. When we look further into 2023, we're actually looking at improving the ergonomics of handwritten queries. So this would allow us to basically write queries in a much more effective manner. So some of the helpers that we're kind of just thinking through are like an interactive subshell, or maybe just SQL queries that you could write directly into the Mongo shell as an easy way to be able to interact with this tool. And that being said, our entire roadmap is largely driven through all of the feedback that you all provide to us. So my ask of you here today when you leave is to go install this in your MongoDB Atlas environment, which is available to you today, and go play around with it. Go connect it with some of the simpler use cases that you have and see if you have ideas on how you can get this integrated with even some of your larger use cases. And most importantly, provide feedback to us. Let us know if there are bugs. Let us know what's missing. Let us know of features that you're interested in. This is the only way that we're going to be able to help each other to continually innovate and make the lives of all of our customers better. Thank you very much for your time today. With that, we'll possibly take some questions, but please do fill out the survey when you get a chance. Thank you. All right, we do have a couple of minutes for questions before we get to the coffee break. Any questions in the audience? Raise your hand. Thank you very much. My question is, uh, this is structural type, is it also according to the SQL 92 uh, standard? Is it also according to the SQL? SQL 92, because you said that uh, the Atlas SQL is implemented based on the SQL 92 yes. standard. Yes. So this structural type is also belong to the SQL 92 standard. Yes, that is correct. Oh. So at the core of it, Atlas SQL follows the SQL 92 dialect, okay. which we then are able to customize and build on top of, but we follow the principles of the standard SQL 92 dialect so that we can keep the user experience for everyone to be the same across all of the apps that you work with. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, one more. We've got time for one more. You mentioned it's SQL 92. So for the structural types, how are, um, can you speak a little bit about maybe inserting data and how the uh, sort of embedded object types that are available in a structure type are handled in just plain SQL? Sure, and this might be a question that we can take offline as well to like dig a little bit deeper into it. But there are two components. So there is the Atlas SQL dialect, which is used to just have the core communication, no matter what type of query you pass through, for example, an insert in your case. Then there is the MongoDB aggregation pipeline that is essentially executing that query. So what we've done is we followed the dialect to ensure that we can understand all of the SQL 
concepts and queries that you pass in into that first block, which goes into the dollar SQL. But then at the same time, what we've also done is made sure, and where I think most of the structural comes in at that point, is inside of MongoDB's aggregation pipeline and its ability to execute that query. Correct, exactly. Thank you all so much. Have a good one. Thanks, y'all.